love. Today we talk about love. The um, what's the day coming? The Valentine's Day. Wow. Like we, there's a lot of love in the air. <clears throat> So this came up yesterday. Somebody asked that we had the meditation day yesterday. It's really a lot of fun, and a lot of people came, and I think we. It was really nice. The, the, and um, there were questions at the end. What what's the Buddha's? Um, did the suttas ever mention about romantic love, or the missing of romantic love? I am thinking, and I was like, no, it didn't mention it too much. The, the, the reason why we don't really have the idea of romantic love in the suttas, it's a bit of a modern invention what we have now. It's uh, all these la- uh, Valentine's Day ideas and this and that and marrying somebody you, you feel connected. It um, wasn't so common in those days. And I think it's a bit of a, there's a lot to do about your perception with when you fall in love with somebody and I said um, on the, one of the things what Ajahn Brahm always mentions about love is that um, you don't really love a person, you love the feeling inside of you. You never truly know anybody. There is a feeling with that oozing love what comes out of you. And, um, but the, you are in love with the feeling, not with the person. So a lot of the, how do we create the world in uh, Buddhism, we have these what we call khandas, the, what really makes it the human. And one of them is perception. You live in your perceptions. And you, it's, they're all, always clouded with something. And I think this love business, whatever that is, as if I don't, never suffered myself, uh, is uh, is a very it clouds your perception. You know, everybody knows you have the rose tinted glasses on, or uh, and um, you fall in love of the idea of that person, and that person might not change, but your perception changes, and then the love could change as well. So even if you love somebody, and then something your perception changes, at the same words, if they tell you you're beautiful one day and next day you really, really dislike them, they call you beautiful again, and that, that's the worst thing you could hear. It, for you, it sounds like they are trying to hold on to you. So it's all these perceptions. But anyways, I knew the Pali word. The Pali word is here in this sutta. And goes, um, so there is a little bit, um, there's a little bit of disgust about love in the suttas. Not the way in this kind of romantic way that's really um that doesn't exist the the word here is that i don't know if i can highlight that okay not that one it's anyways it's the first which is the pali word the born to be beloved the pia is the chataka means to be born sutta obviously means that you know this this teaching so pia is the word for love Meta is the most of the time what we talk about, meta, and, but that is loving kindness towards as if like mother loves their child and that kind of love. It really doesn't have attachment. This is the love we are talking about most of the time when we talk about love. Here Ajahn is, uh, um, Sujato has translated as uh, um, from beloved, so it is, if it is something you you cherish something you you wanna. It's still sort of this kind of family kind of love. So not we skip a little bit of this. Um, um, the first one there, the the that's a, that's what I've heard and all that. And then so what happens in this sutta now? There was a one person whose um, only child has passed away, and after the after the the child has passed away. He didn't feel like working or eating, so he would go to the cemetery and, well, where are you, my only child? Where are you, my only child? And, um, and he was just out of his mind. And we have a lot of this kind of stories in the sutta. Somebody has died. There were famous um, sutta of um, this one of this nun who lost his 
husband and children and all that, and she went absolutely mad and went to see the Buddha. And the Buddha, it's a famous story, it's about Kisa Gotami, and the Buddha said, haven't you ever seen... No, oh, anyways, the, so what the Buddha did, he said, well, okay, I can, I can bring your... Um, child back or I can if you can go to a household which you can find it was a uh, really common at the time they were using mustard seeds for um, um, to spice up everything it was like the one of these common foods they used to eat and he said if you can go to any house and get me a mustard seed and and if you can get me the mustard seed from a house or you have to get it from a house where there has nobody died in that household and she said, okay, great, um, the Buddha can bring my child back. I think I'm actually just realizing, mixing up two stories um, here. But anyway, so, uh, so the, he said, she thought, okay, Buddha can bring my child back to life. And um, he, so she started to go from house to house looking for mustard seeds. And she said, um, but she quickly re, uh, realized that there is not a one household in, in, the, in the village where there's nobody ever died. So there's always death. And this is what happens here as well in this sutta. So this, uh, this person went to the Buddha and the Buddha said, well, looks like the, you're out of your mind. Your faculties have deteriorated. And, and then the person tells like, of course, because my my only child has passed away, and since the death of my my son, I haven't felt like working or eating. So I go to the cemetery and well, where are you, my only child? Where are you, my only child? That is true, householder. That is true, householder. For our loved ones are the source of sorrow, lamentation, pain, and sa pain, sadness, and distress. Great Buddhist idea of love. Our loved ones are a source of sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. Buddhism is very, very much into this love business, as you can see. So the and uh, and here the person goes uh, really disapproves to what the Buddha just said. He says, uh, tells the Buddha, "Sir, who on earth could ever think such a thing?" For our loved ones are the source, source of joy and happiness. Disagreeing with the Buddha's statement, rejecting it, he got up from his seat and left. Yeah, so here again you can see the word piacatika, and I kind of highlight, it doesn't matter. So anyway, so anyone who are born from love are the one, they are source of joy and happiness. And we can see that, right? So there's a couple... Um, uh, places where the Buddha mentioned how this kind of um, love um, comes about, and he said there's a there's a story about if you start associating with somebody, you spend a lot of time with them, you start getting to know them, and this the love grows from that. And I think it's true once you really uh, know the person, that affection. This could be translated affection. Uh, um, the 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 love grows from that. The affection grows to your child when you spend time with them. The affection grows towards uh, your partner when you start spending with time with them, and that's what happens. And that's um, uh, that's what happened here. So the person disagreed with the Buddha's statement, rejected it, and he got up from his seat and left. And then there were, he left and there were some people gambling right outside of the, where the Buddha was living. And then the householder, this person, went to them and said the same thing. Look, they, I have a, a dead son. I'm just showing you the Pali now. Um, and then the, this is what I, I went to the told Buddha. You know, my son has just died. And the Buddha said, yes, it's true. Um, our loved ones create, uh, bring us a lot of... Uh, uh, pain, sorrow, lamentation. And the, the gamblers even said that, yes, that's true, householder. That can't be right. That the, the gamblers agreed with this person. They said, no, no, no. The loved ones are the source of joy and happiness. Love is a good thing, right? The, even the gamblers agree with him. So the, this 
this topic, this idea went back to the royal compound into the King Pasenadi and Queen, uh, Queen Malika. Queen Malika is, uh, is one of the chief disciples of the Buddha or um, really a smart lady. She married this King Pasenadi. Um, so the king heard this and he said, told the Queen Malika, he said, you're a Sedic Gotama. This is talking about the Buddha. He said this, our loved ones are the source of sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. And the Queen Malika says, if the Buddha says that, then it, that must be how it is. And, uh, and then the king sort of gets really angry with the, his wife. And he says, no matter what the Sedic Gautama says, that's a sort of um, putting down the Buddha, uh, calling somebody just a Sedic Gautama, it means like a wonder. You agree with him. Well, and then Malika says, if that's what the Buddha said, then it must, that's how it must be. And then the queen, the queen says to the wife and says, you're like, just like a student <clears throat> who agrees everything what the teacher says. Um, is there anything interesting? The teacher there, the word is acharya. Quite sometimes we, we use that word, acharya is a teacher. And he gets really angry with his wife. He said, get out of here. That can't be right. Our, our loved ones cannot be a source of unhappiness. So then the queen did what it was the time, uh, normal at the time. He, she couldn't take the phone call or send an email to the Buddha. Uh, instead, she said, told his um, servant, can you go and uh, see the Buddha? And uh, pay respect to him. He said, you know, like, um, and say... Could you tell him that I hope you're well and all that? And the same thing we do in emails these days, and you know, and and then say to the Buddha, um, "Did you make this statement? Is it true that you said our loved ones are the source of sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress?" And then remember, and please come back to me and um, tell this to me what the Buddha says that because of the. Here, Ajahn Suchato has translated the Tathagata, the realized ones say nothing that is not so. Um, so the Tathagata is either thus gone or realized one is it's a good translation as anything. And the messenger said, yes, of course I go. He went to the Buddha, uh, bowed down to him. When the polite conversation was over, he sat down to one side and said to the Buddha, the Queen Malika heard that you said this and asked me to ask you this question. And uh, has you, have you made this statement? Our loved ones are the source of sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. That is right, Brahmin. That is right. Um, for our loved ones are source of sorrow, lamentation, sadness, and distress. And hear how you should understand how our loved ones are source of sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. Once upon a time, now the Buddha is talking, once upon the time here in Savati, a certain woman, woman's mother passed away, and because of that she went mad and lost her mind. She went from street to street and from square to square saying, has anybody seen my mother? Has anybody seen my mother? And this, here's another way, of understanding how loved ones are source of sorrow, lamentation, pain, and distress. And then he, the Buddha gives all these th different people who came, who have come to him and complain about somebody has died. So woman's uh, father, brother, sister, son, daughter, husband had passed away. And the same thing had happened. They were looking for this dead person, to, like, has anybody seen them? And the same, then there goes um, another man, a man, um, um, men have come to me and said the same thing. Somebody has passed away. And because of that, they lost their mind. And that's the way to understand how the our loved ones are sores or sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. Um, and then there's an interesting one. This is a little bit, not just a death, but now we go into this uh, another stress which is really common and gets uh, asked a lot from the monks. Once upon a time, right here in Savati, a certain woman went to live with her relative's family, but her relatives wanted to divorce her from her husband and give her to another. Okay, well, it doesn't happen that way, but there, um, there's uh, divorces happen these days. 
and she didn't want to um, another husband. So she told her husband about this. So when he did, he killed her and killed himself after that. He says here, uh, but, but he cut in her in two, and it says exactly right there, Tvidha, meaning in two, disemboweled him, meaning uh, the person himself did a committed uh, like a ritual um, suicide. He didn't just take his bowels out, but that's how it, Ajahn Suchado has translated quite it there. And his thinking was that we shall go uh, be together after death. And that's how the one of the stories Buddha had heard in the Savati. And that is a, another way of understanding that there is a loved ones are source of sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. And um, we can understand that there's uh, there's a lot of sadness which comes from these um, divorces or you lose somebody. We we definitely understand that the love is there. And it's like this feeling which is really we hold on to very dear to our hearts but the losing is always there there's a quite a Ajahn Brahm tells a story quite often there's a couple in England who lived close to the monastery in England and there was one of these very amicable uh, husband and wife who lived together for a long time and they they used to support the monastery there and um Apparently, they never argued anything. They were just really well, um, husband and wife, who did well. And then the husband died, like, he was like 86 and she was 85. And she said, nothing feels the same to me anymore. She was really upset about it being, when they, they've been together for such a long time. And then the husband died. And it's, it's for her, it's almost like it felt like meaningless. None of the, this mattered that we live together for such a long time. And she died, I think, within a few months after the husband because she was so sad about it. So even if this, uh, the relationship is very amicable, there is a lot of care towards the other person. There's always the sorrow follows from there at the end. Buddhism is very positive. <laughs> I give you a little bit of positive spin at the end, so don't worry. It's not all, all uh, death and dying and losing people. Okay, so then, then, then this messenger went back to the, uh, his, um, the Queen Malika and said what the, uh, the Buddha had said, all of this, the story. And then the Queen Malika went, approached his husband and said to him, and conveying this mes message, and says, what do you think, King, great king? Do you love Princess Vajiri? Indeed, I do. That's the daughter, which I'm not sure whether it's actually her daughter or is it from the other wife. Indeed, I do, Malika. What do you think, cried King? If your if your daughter would perish, uh, anyways, I think the perish there is like the time is up. Then die. Would sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress arise you? If she was to deck, where to decay and perish, my life would fall apart. How could sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress not <coughs> arise in me? <coughs> well, this is what the Buddha said when he was referring to our loved ones are source of sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. What do you think, great king, to love Lady Vasaba? That's uh, this uh, king's second wife. Uh, do you love your son, Channel Vidudabha? Vidudabha. And then they, they go through the same same thing. And then she asked, do you love me? This is the queen Malika asking. And he says, indeed, I love you, Malika. And here again, we see the word Pia. That's the word for love. And the reason I happen to remember that, I'm not sure if... Uh, 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 okay, well, I, I mentioned that. It, it reminds me of the name of my first girlfriend, so that's why I remember the word really. Is. <laughs> Embarrassing indeed. Slightly different, but uh, yeah. Anyways. 
So I have experienced sorrow, lamentation, pain. Uh, what do you think, great king? If I were to die, would sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and distress arise in you? If you were to decay and perish, my life would fall apart. How could sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and distress not arise in me? Well, then the, uh, the queen says that this is what the Buddha was referring to when he said, our loved ones are the source of sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and distress. And then it goes into a little bit of different spin, which is the Buddha didn't say this, but the Queen Malika, apparently was, she was really smart lady, and she said, she continues, what do you think, uh, my husband, do you love the realms of Kasi and Kosala? He was the king, they were the king and queen of this Kasi and Kosala region. Indeed I do, Malika. It's due to the bounty of Kasi and Kosala that we use sandalwood imported from Kasi and wear garlands, perfume, and makeup. Um, that's by the way, the Malaganda, Vilepana, Dharna, that's all that. If you take eight precepts, the, the Pali word is the same word, Pali word, Malaganda, Vilepana. Uh, okay, so they wear garland perfumes and makeup, and they are famous in those days for all of that. What do you think, great king? If these realms were to decay, perish with sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress rise in you, if all these countries would fall apart, how could not sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress arise in me? This is what the Buddha also was referring to when he said, our loved ones are source of sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress. And the, queen, the king goes incredible, Malika, it's amazing. How far the Buddha sees him with the penetrating wisdom, it seems to me. Come, Malika, rinse my hands. This is like a, you wash somebody's hands to um, make them clean when you're paying respect to somebody. And then the king Pasenari got up from his seat, arranged his rope over one shoulder like the monks do these days, raised his joint palms towards the Buddha and expressed his heartfelt sentiment. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed, perfectly enlightened, one fully awakened. So, it's interesting, no matter where you look in this life, whether it's a person, or it is something you own, your house, how, how much stress it is when we, in Australia, we have these bushfires, and people, instead of leaving the house, they, go, they stay as, po as long as possible, hosing down the gutters. Not, they're holding on to this idea of the house. And you hear stories about if there's somebody's house burning, they run inside just to rescue the photography, the, the pictures of their loved ones, because otherwise they have no, uh, nothing to remember their family of if they would lose those pictures. We hold on to something always in life which are ideas, which are something dear to us, but ultimately they always cause us suffering. So this Buddhism, do we have idea of romantic, uh, romantic love and all that? No, it's not really found in any ways. We have very, very few, even this word pia is not uh, used many places. Um, it is here and there in, uh, in, in some of these um, stories, some of the poetry is used, and this is quite a rare sutta actually where this word is used. And even then the Buddha says, it's, it sounds quite very um, straightforward. Somebody comes to me and like, somebody comes to the, went to the Buddha and says like, oh, my son has died. And you know, like, um, I, like he was, I think he was hoping something, the Buddha would say something, you know, help him to um, do something for him. And he says, yeah, that's nothing I can do about it. And the loved, your loved ones are, causes you a lot of grief. And he didn't really accept it. But um, even for me to relate to my um, own life, it's uh, it's interesting. We, I come from um, a countryside, really. We have a farm. I, Mom comes from another farm, and dad bought the farm we live in. 
And the farm we live in has been in our family for generations and generations and generations, many hundreds of years. And mother's family, we know that it's been the first person to move. They were 17, 26. We have this um, little wind, um, which shows the wind direction. I don't know the word. But so there is a lot of attachment to the land I come from. And even for me, having now lived for a long, long time away from the farm, if the idea that somebody would, there would be another family there living in that farm, in that house, which was built by my father. And if I would be walking towards the farm, like I grew up there, I spent so much time there, and I would now, if I go and visit uh, my village, walk from the bus stop, walk towards the farm, and I would see, and I, I would see that there's somebody else living there, and I don't belong there anymore. It would be tremendously stressful for me. It would be still all those memories and all those things that it, it feels like it should belong to my family. But it's nothing there, ultimately, which I would really grieve for. If somebody comes like, okay, you grieve for this land. Here, I give you a plastic bag, full plastic bag, full of this the soil. And let me give you, you know, a couple branches of a tree there. What is it to me? None of this land, it doesn't have any value. It's not that what I long for, what I have attachment towards. It, it is the attachment towards the idea of that land. And all these stories about how it's been a family and I, all the things you've been at. A lot of us, we know that thing. We know how attached we are to things. Yet, at the same time, people said, oh, I hope my relative gets enlightened when, you know, when they pass away. Or I hope, um, sorry, did I just knock it off? Um, did it just, um, it might be that I knocked it. Um, that we are attached to so many things and these attachments go really deep. And the more you start looking them, more carefully you start looking them, there is a lot of grief, distress, really uh, deep sorrow what comes from that. So, if we can get this back working, which... We, okay, so I'll continue. So I was, I'm trying to give it a bit of a positive spin on this love. But the, I think a lot of these ideas now, we have the, um, I'm sorry, I lost my idea. Um, we have the, the, this idea of like, we should cherish our loved ones. It is true. But we need to find what is the right way to hold on to something. And if, if we can get this sutta coming up, I, I'll tell you what is the right way. Is it coming up? It is up. Okay, cool. Um, so, interesting enough, in the next two suttas, they spread about, they talk about it, a little bit of this kind of um, um, skillful ways of using your. Um, to behave, how to, um, um, how to live the life. What doesn't lead into sorrow, lamentation, grief. Um, okay, so here in this first sutta, this, I'm not going to talk about so much, but this is the next sutta after that. Um, and then the, there is another, there's a person who's going to just happen to be another king who meets uh, the Buddha's main assistant, Ananda, on the street. And he goes, he goes with the elephant, let's, could we go and have a talk somewhere? And the Ananda said, yeah, okay, let's have a go and let's go to the uh, park on the next to the river. And then, and then they go and ask him, and he's, he's met, this king has met all these other teachers. And he says, uh, he was asking, what kind of, what leads to happiness? There's, a, there's a quite a lot of sutta before this, but then, he, the, so the Ananda goes, there's a skillful behavior what leads you into happiness. And, you know, and the kaya is there, the bodily behavior, so it was like, 
it could be bodily behavior, it could be mental behavior. They talk about both here later. So what kind of behavior, let's delete the bodily out, what kind of behavior is skillful? Blameless behavior. Okay, so the, sometimes these suttas are strange because they just almost seems to be going into like this spinning, like nobody's answering any, uh, giving any answers really. So the king asks like, well, what kind of, what kind of behavior is blameless? Pleasing behavior. <laughs> Again, it doesn't seem to, seem to give you an answer. What kind of, but what kind of bodily behavior is pleasing? Behavior that results in happiness. And the interesting word here is the behavior that results in happiness. And uh, then the word there is sukha vipako. The vipaka, quite often we use this word karma or kamma in Buddhism. Kamma actually is a better translated as a work. You're doing something. Vipaka is the result. So quite often when you talk about something, oh, this is my kamma, this is my karma, you're actually talking about vipaka. You're talking about result. So kamma is doing something, intentionally putting effort, creating something good. So you're trying to do, um, help somebody, you're doing good kamma. And then if you get happiness out of that by helping somebody, the vipaka is what you get. You don't get kamma. It doesn't work that way. You get result. So going back here, uh, behavior that results in happiness, that is, uh, that is a good behavior. But what kind of behavior results in happiness? A behavior that leads to pleasing yourself, pleasing others, and pleasing both. And which makes the unskillful qualities decline while skillful qualities grow. That kind of behavior is not faulted by any sensible um, teachers. And then they go to verbal behavior and mental behavior. Same thing happens here. So whatever you do in life, if it's the word pleasing here, but basically it creates happiness in your life, creates happiness in um, others, and it creates happiness in both. When you talk, you want to speak in a way that is kind towards yourself. You have to take care of yourself. You have to try to create happiness towards both of us, and then uh, towards the other person, and that creates harmony, happiness in both of our lives. And it goes with the mental, even Buddhism, uh, sometimes people ask, does it matter how you think? Does it really, the you know, thinking mind, does it lead, you know, do you create karma with your thinking mind? It flows from that, it follows from that. You cannot really have bad intentions and expect something good to come out of that. If you have intention of of greed, or let's say hatred is easy to think of. If you really are angry at somebody, yet you try to speak pleasing words, it doesn't really come out that way. You sort of can modify it a little bit that way, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't lead to happiness of both. So try to relate this back to the, uh, the previous sutta. Sure, we have loved ones. We have people who we, have, we hold dear in our lives. And we try to have um, behavior which leads in the happiness of both. And then the next sutta I'm now going to come after this, I show what should be, what is like, a, what is a very good way of living life in a relationship. But then it's, I like this idea that whatever we do, in Buddhism, we don't just our, oh, you know, um, do to your neighbor as you you would like them, you know, like to um, them to to you, uh, work or behave towards you. In Buddhism, we always try to we have to include ourselves in our behavior. We cannot just give love if we don't have anything to give. We have to first have money in the bank. We first have to have loving kindness 
hold ourselves dear to our own heart. And then from there, then you have re results uh, which, come, which are leading into happiness. I'm not sure I'm, I'm doing a really good job teaching here, but I see a lot of blank faces. But let's go to the next one. The, the shrines of, to the teaching. Um, interesting word here. Like, I, sorry, I'm like Pali because this is sort of <laughs> what I do a lot. The, the word chetia is there. The, um, chetia is, uh, do we have chetias? Like these are the chetias here, like we have on the shrine. Those are the little shapes. Those would be called chetias. And Ajahn Suchado has translated here the shrine. So that would be almost like a shrine. And then they used to have in those kind of vessels, they used to quite often have the ashes of the teachers and even, I think, a lot of uh, lay people. So the, the chaitiyas of the, of the teaching, the shrines to the teaching. Okay, so I'm going to skip again quite a bit. Uh, the, what happens here is, again, you know, the, somebody's going to go and... Um, uh, talk to the the Buddha. It's actually um, this king. Um, he comes from the same place. This person comes from the same village that the Buddha, or the same area. And he is old by this time, and he he's thinking, I think I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna die soon. So he wants to go and see the Buddha. Um, okay. Yes. Now I went too far. Okay, so there, there, there's an, uh, there seems to be a lot of kings. So anyway, so there's another king who goes to see the Buddha. And um, he explains that he's really inspired by the, the, the Sangha, meaning the monks and nuns. And he is really inspired by the Buddha. The, he actually goes in the beginning, he, once he reaches the Buddha, and he says, like he bows down to his feet and kisses his feet. And the Buddha said, why are you doing this? This seems to be a bit excessive. And he said, I'm so inspired. And then this is actually what the king is talking. It's like he's seen, he's seen other teachers which are not so inspiring. inspiring. And he's, he explains from his day to day life what he sees. It's, um, I see a lot of kings fight with kings. I see aristocrats fight with aristocrats, uh, aristocrats, Brahmins fight with Brahmins, house, householders with householders. A mother fight with, fights with her child, child with mother, father with child, a child with father, brother fights with brother, brother with sister, sister with brother, and friends fight with friends. And he never mentions anything about sister fight with sister, so it doesn't seem to happen. <laughs> so, Okay, but see here, I see mendicants, which is meaning bhikkhu, so I, anyways, it's, it means monks. Living in harmony, appre appreciating each other without quarreling, blending like milk and water, regarding each other with kindly eyes. I don't, I don't see any other assembly anywhere so harmonious, so I fear about this to the Buddha, this about the Buddha from the teachings. So I like that sentence. Here actually, we started with this love. We started from uh, somebody who's affectionate to you. But then what quite often in the suttas is referred, like I said, we don't really have anything about romantic love in, in the suttas. But what is quite often raised in the suttas is harmony. This king is saying, I see a lot of times um, uh, people arguing with him, uh, arguing with each other, and they're fighting, not uh, living in harmony. But then here, when he went to this monastery where the Buddha was living at that time, he can see the, the monks living in harmony. They appreci appreciate each other. They don't, um, they don't quarrel. They blend like milk and water, regard each other with kindly eyes. And this is praised in the suttas. The harmony is highly regarded by the Buddha. Harmony is more important than this kind of feeling of love. The love sort of perhaps it can, I can see why the biology has equipped us with a certain kind of behavior to bring us together, hold us the first, the first few years, get the babies coming, and then the hard work comes. 
the, then the work is to live in harmony. The harmony is what you need to then put the effort in. The, um, that is really regarded as something really, the harmony, um, not quarreling. And um, that is regarded something as happiness, high happiness. Love, which is, record, uh, which is sold for us in everyday life, it doesn't really lead into happiness, into high happiness. It's a very sticky feeling in the beginning. It's a something which come, you know, brings us together. But that kind of romantic idea, it doesn't last. But harmony lasts. Harmony is something which we should regard as something we need to nurture. That is what we mean by love. So then, the, because of this, the, uh, he says that the, the, the Sangha, the monks and nuns are practicing well. And furthermore, and this goes a little bit off the topic, but he's seen a lot of uh, monks in the different monasteries, meaning a lot of other ascetics, and they seem to be very haggard, pale, vainly, hardly, hardly a captivating sight, you think. It occurred to me, clearly these venables, these other ascetics, lead the spiritual life dissatisfied, or they're hiding some bad deed they've done. That's why they're thin, haggard, pale, vainly. Hardly a captivating sight, you think. And I, and I went to them and asked them, why are you so thin and not doing so well? They said, we have a John, this great king, and they, you know, well, we have, we're sickly. But here I see mendicants always smiling and joyful, obviously happy, with cheerful faces, living relaxed, unruffled, surviving on charity, with their hearts free as wild deer. It occurred to me, clearly these venerables have realized the higher distinctions, you know, they understood the Buddha's teachings. That's why they're always smiling, um, joyful, ha obviously happy with cheerful faces, with living relaxed, unruffled, surviving on charity with their hearts free as wild deer. So I like the idea that the, the, the Sangha, the monks and nuns, if they're, doing, if they're living in harmony, they are smiling, they're joyful, they're obviously happy with cheerful faces, living relaxed, un unruffled. And I think this one it's, um, applies to everybody. If you live in harmony with your family, you are relaxed. You are, you're living relaxed, you're unruffled. You're, you have, you're joyful and people can see it. It comes from the harmony. It doesn't come from this idea of romantic love. It comes from that somebody you can trust, you appreciate them, and they behaving kindly towards you and you are behaving kindly towards them. That is high happiness. So I, I started by saying how all of this, the idea of love leads to a lot of suffering. But then this is the positive spin. There is positive things when living with others. If you come from a place of truly caring this person, appreciating them, then you're living relaxed, cheerful life, and he shows from you. And that is the Buddha's idea of love. And that's the end of the talk. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Now we can go to the questions, complaints. Uh, thank, thanks for the talk. Yep. Uh, John. Uh, I just wanted to. Uh, it seems that that, that that talk was very idealistic. Idealistic, right? It could be. Yeah. Mm. Um, when life, like, how is it practical for people that have got, like, really 
troubling relationships with their family and maybe with you know other people as well well yeah um understand and then that's why it's not idealistic because you you're not gonna they're gonna die so how on how idealistic is that you know they are actually causing a lot of grief because in um even in this sort of actually continues that then the, the the king says that even if I'm trying to execute, fine, or banish those who are guilty, and they they keep um, arguing with me, interrupting me, and uh, the people always try to put us down. So yes, we give this idealistic idea that harmony is that you know like high blessing, high. So you try to create that, going into the sutta in the middle, you're trying to trying to create a behavior which leads into happiness in your own life. So if your um, your family is giving you a lot of grief, when then it's better for you to spend more time by yourself. Living, you know, how can I create more happiness in my life? And then from there, the hap it's perhaps it's more happiness for both of you. So sure, it is the idealistic, but um, in reality, sure, life is complicated. But if we don't see the, that, okay, they will also die, we will never realize that we have to even care, even if this seems to be difficult for both of us. So we do this contemplation, how do you, so there is no really changing them. You're changing your own perception. Perhaps your perception is that, so that, yes, they are difficult and it might be sort of quite real. But if you start looking at them, that w sooner or later would they will die. You start caring about them, because that is actually the reality. So you have a little bit of distance, and you see them as a you know person who's going to get sick old age and uh, die. You start really caring about them more. You see everybody causing grief for other everybody else. So you change your own behavior. So, yeah, I mean, sure, they are idealistic, but it wasn't very idealistic what the Buddha said in the sutta. Like, yeah, our loved ones causes sorrow, pain, and, and distress. And same thing. The person said, no, that's not true. Our loved ones are, you know, a source of happiness. And you just said, no, your loved ones are not a source of happiness to you. Yeah. So yeah, I guess, the, I mean, I was talking about that, the harmony the harmony. Oh, the harmony yeah, part, yeah. yeah. No, well, sometimes you have to have a little bit of distance, so give them, give harmony. But I, it's interesting, like you, you can see in your own life, my loved ones, my, my family, is actually a cause of a lot of distress. And the, the contemplation on them dying, is that what you think would bring um, the That is one for, thing. Like personally or for between us as well? Uh, no, you do the practice for yourself. Uh, there's an interesting, i give you a simile. Ajahn Chah gave this simile that like, he took a cup and he said, look, this, the, this glass is as a fracture and someday w somebody will drop this glass and it will splint, you know, it just go into these pieces and we never could put it back together. And the same thing if the if the cup was a um, you know, metal cup, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to ever care about it. But because things are can break really easy, we need to take care of them. So you realize how fragile everybody are because you see the sitting in your yourself and you start caring more because you see everything is fragile. So I need to care about others. So you're changing yourself. The practice is for yourself. And then it flows from that to the others. And then it creates harmony for you, for the other person, and for us. Yeah. I can say that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. No worries. Good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been thinking about how to put this one into words, but I thought you know, life would be so different now than it was in Buddha's time, um, culturally as well. Because, uh, I, you know, I've looked at lots of videos and sometimes Googled things and um, have struggled to find specific questions, you know, like mm. you mentioned the love thing mm. today. Mm. Um, 
And two of the things that I think are really different now, uh, and I think it's because it's quite relevant to to my life mm. and the people around me, mm. um, is the role of animals in people's lives, you know, to the point where pets are more important to people than humans, uh, to the degree where we have, you know, pet bereavement counsellors. But I'm actually studying that, so, I, you know, I know mm. grief mm. and the loss of pets. And, you know, I've never seen anything that said someone came to Buddha and said, I'm so sad, my dog of 12 years, my best friend has died. Lots of, you know, fathers, mothers, daughters. Yeah. Um, and the other one is this big cultural shift of women never having children um, and the term childlessness mm -hmm. by circumstance. Mm -hmm. And again, I haven't ever said some, seen something that said, you know, a woman approached Buddha, um, the Buddha and she was in her 40s and she said, I'm grieving because I never had a child. I've already read, mm -hmm. you know, a child's but they're dying. Grieving that they, well, no, there are cases like that. Yeah. But they, it was mostly about because it was really your f you almost like a duty. But, I mean, sure, I'm sure yeah. the mothers love their children the way. We, but there were a lot of uh, many cases where they just couldn't conceive. Like the mothers were really distressed, like, I can't get a baby. Yeah, well, that's still really big now, you know, grief yeah. and loss. Um, but I think when it comes down to it, there is something, there's always there and I just wonder do you think it really comes down to you know either really struggling with the idea that things are impermanent that's the loss and the grief side and yeah. also attachment to an idea of in your head you had an idea of how things should be so yeah well I mean the only thing I uh, I can think of the okay the, I yes I and I definitely we had a lot of um, sorrow when our bed dog for many years died and I remember that, and it was really stressful. Like, like I said, it almost felt more more grief than when my grandmother died. Um, the, but you can apply to that teaching. The the Queen Malika there said that if we would lose our land for the the king, and it says, look, and he said, look, that I would just go crazy. I would absolutely, you know, if I lose my land. So whether you know, you can apply to anything. Losing a pet, losing your house, losing your not just your family, anything, it is tremendously stressful. It's, you know, or the, the word we use is the dukkha, suffering. It's a tr there's a tremendous suffering, anything we lose, because we have so much uh, attachment to the dog, so much attachment to the house. For us, my family, attachment to the farms we have, uh, attachment to fam uh, families, and we all can see that. It hasn't really changed that much. We have tremendous attachment to the family, and what it causes us is a lot of suffering. And there is no way out of it. We cannot give you answers. We can only tell you, lessen the attachment by you disappearing slowly, slowly. And then the attachments disappear from there. You cannot just sort of will yourself not to be attached to a dog, your, your pet, to your family. It, you, it, it's, you cannot think your way out of your not caring about your family. Even if your, your family is difficult, you cannot just sort of like, okay, I don't care about them. It just doesn't work like that. You, tend, you need to sort of disappear that strong sense of self and attachment becomes less and less. And obviously, so you start, you're seeing it, you know, with different, your, your perception changes then. Your, your perception to this, um, the attachment changes. You, you, you appreciate more of the time we have together now. I think there's a lot of truth to that when we only um, appreciate somebody when we lose them. When they're always there, we don't tend to appreciate it. So we... We need to more care them more when they're there. Whether it's dog or your mom and dad or something, whatever. We te tend not to say ki enough kindly words and kind behavior, kind, um, uh, poorly mentally uh, words towards each other. The, the, we tend to just leave it, at, not do it enough. And we recommend that. I mean, look, it's in the, sut in the suttas here that we, you have to have all of these behaviors have to be 
kind in order for it to lead happiness in your own life. So I don't think it's, yeah, sure, I mean, things have changed and they haven't. But the romantic idea, I think is, it, there is certain kind of artificialness in it, which has brought, which they keep marketing to us these days. And, um, and it's everywhere, it's very sticky. And then, uh, and I, I think one of the reasons why monks and nuns, we live in the monasteries and we try not to associate too much with, with others because the, the affection grows from that. If you start associating too much time with somebody, you start knowing them, you start noticing good qualities and the affection grows from there. So we, we tend to have to physically room ourselves from the world. It's one of the reasons, yeah. Yep. Okay, any qu other questions? Yes, on the back there. Uh, I just have an online question. Let's do online. You can take the micro. Could you take the microphone to her? Let's reach it. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Ajahn. Uh, There's a question for online. Yeah. How can we use this contemplation to be more kind? How do you use contemplation to be more kind? Well, um, Death, death. Yeah, well, the, that is the death contemplation actually does lead you into being more kind because you realize that we all will we all will die and when we don't know. Yesterday we did the, on the walking meditation on the lunchtime. I said people to do a lot of death, a little bit of death contemplation by when you're doing a walking meditation, you do you're stepping down. I will die, and on the next foot you put, say, that's for sure. I will die, that's for sure. I will die, that's for sure. And it is actually, once you put in the effort, we really contemplated death. You're putting into effort, yes, I will die, that's for sure. And then I remember one nun uh, whose mother had passed away, and she said that she does that contemplation a lot. And she, she added into that, and when, I don't know. So it adds into that um, uh, like I should do something now. I don't know when I'm going to die. I might live long, but I don't know. I don't know when my loved ones will um, die. So I need to care about them now instead of just postponing it. Sometimes the caring is more like you have a distance and then you have a bit of a distance. You, have, you can easily, more easily care about them, more easily have kind thoughts to your family when you have distance to them. But the, um, so death contemplation gives you the impetus. Otherwise, you just, nothing really matters. If we will live long, long time and you wouldn't like, oh, you could always postpone. You can always do it tomorrow. You can... And if none of this matters, if, if, you, if the caring doesn't lead into, into happiness in here, well, we don't need to care. If you never felt that somebody really took care of you, if you never feel, felt that, you're missing out a lot of things in life. The care is a tremendously important thing to keep us alive even. They say that if, you, if somebody's in coma and you want to keep them alive, you need to physically, it's good to physically touch them and talk to them as if they were there, and that keeps them alive. It's one of the nutriments what keeps humans going is physical touch. It's interesting. Not just food. Food, it's one source of what keeps a human alive. But... Physical touch and that kind of being there keeps us alive. If we lose all of that, we tend to disappear. You start fading away from this world. It's a tremendously, really, really important thing to do. So I have no idea what I just answered. And the question, I forget now, but let's go to the next question. I'm a little confused. Yeah, that good. <laughs> You're not the only one, by the way. Yeah. Speaking on behalf of everyone here, yeah. uh, that I really appreciate um, what the first question was asked 
that on the one hand, if you have issues, I don't have issues with my family, yeah. but I feel like to grow, I need to separate a little. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, the, I'm confused when you said have care for your family mm. and realise if you're going to die, then all the more reason to have care if you're yeah. going to die one day. By removing yourself, that feels really uncomfortable yeah. on the one hand and how you, I, I understand you're saving lo loving thoughts to them, but how – I don't know how to do that. Mm. It, feel, it feels uncomfortable yeah. on the one hand, but it feels – um, enlightening on the other hand. So how are you caring about them if you're removing what? themselves? It mm. feels scary. Yeah, absolutely. But, but, I, but I feel like to grow, yeah. I need to do that. That's interesting. Mm. Well, I think, that, like you said, it's tremendously, tremendous suffering. And then on starting from the sutta, this person's son, only son died and he, was, he went crazy. He went around in the, where is my son, you know, wailing that you know he has lost his son and looking like where is he uh the yeah it is tremendously suffering and that's why that is the teaching it's not easy the buddhist teachings are like yeah we will all die we will be all separated from our loved ones and then so that is the ultimate teaching there is no sugar coating it or there is no making it any better if the, we were joined in somewhere in a in a heavenly realm and we'll be happy ever after well unfortunately this is not the religion to tell you that acceptance, acceptance oh yeah jinda was just saying that accept and ex accept the change uh to a point i mean like what we have to sort of internalize these teachings slowly slowly and you start seeing that the the holding the the love, the love comes with a package. And the stronger you hold into it, so you start slowly perhaps accepting. You slowly start, like, I can see that I have this tremendous package with me I'm carrying. And it comes with the fear of losing. You start slowly, slowly working towards that. And I can see that there is a lot of stress in that. Hold everything lightly in life, even your family. The attachment tends to be there, but if you can start slowly losing it, it leads into your into your own happiness. It is difficult to see, but that how it that's how it is. Okay, I get that. So the second half is, if you're developing harmony and peace and calmness in yourself, mm. and you feel anger towards, say, a member of your family, yeah, do you verbalize that or do you? Keep continuing um, working on yourself. Well, um, yeah, I would. I would more. I mean, short discussion is always good. And uh, but the, I would start working more on that. Um, don't believe too much of your perceptions. To start seeing your perceptions, perhaps could be um, colored. Okay, is this really the truth? Um, I can't remember ever seeing in the Buddhist teachings that the, he would recommend um, telling other people off and telling how it is. Yep. I give you my five, you know, my piece and this, it, it is. Um, if it leads into, look, it, whatever the situation is, mm -hmm. if it leads to your own happiness, if it leads to happiness of that, that you know, your, your family member, it leads to happiness of both of you. Yep. Yeah. Yep. By all means, you, then you use the right skillful speech. And if you feel it doesn't? Well, then you should hold your peace, I would think. Don't, yeah. don't, don't do anything. I mean, and look, you know, sometimes you, you start working towards that. You, know, you start the conversation and perhaps leads to the... Thank um, you. Was there somebody in the back I saw somebody's hand or was they just stretching? Dr. Jai, Dr. Jai wants to... Yep, good. Well then. Uh, <laughs> Bhante, the, for harmony, you need more than one person. I mean, harmony is with bilateral or multilateral. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. You can do your bit by being wise and being kind and uh, doing everything right. But uh, it really doesn't work in a situation because it depends on other people. Yeah. Because the second or third... It takes two to tango. The group, yeah. 
So I think it's almost impossible yep. to get a completely harmonious situation yep. because you, can't, you are not responsible for others' defilements and cankers yeah. and habits. And so all. your loved ones live to yeah. an unhappiness. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. I think uh, the best thing is one can... Uh, Become a monk. Give, give, yeah. get, no. Well, that yeah. is even yeah. worse, I think. Yeah. <laughs> they are separate yeah. from the rest of the yeah, world. Yeah, that's right. You, you have to live with the difficult people to become wiser. Yeah. Uh, the point is one can attain peace only by even try to live in a disharmonious situation. Yeah. By wisdom and yeah. understanding how the world works, uh, law of causality, and uh, there are things that you can't change. Yeah. To understand that only one can be peaceful, but very difficult to create a harmonious society. Uh, can see even the countries, people, corporations. Yeah. Beings. Well, look, I, I think uh, um, with the harmony, we have to. I like that it's like the idea that it's like even in our own heads, there tends to be a fight going on a lot of times. There tends to be a lot of disagreements in your own mind. But you have to start looking at even your own mind, like as like is a committee in your own mind. It's made out of different people. Don't believe too much on that person who's creating disharmony in your own life. And sure, it's sli it is idealistic, this last one. Perhaps it didn't work out, this last one didn't work out so well. But I can see everybody's complaining now. It's like, yeah, yeah, but it's good enough, but you know, there's actually a lot of disharmony. Well, then go back to the first one. Your loved ones create you a lot of problem, right? Okay, yeah, it's not idealistic. That's real world. But we need to have to work. It's like, yeah, I can see that there is a lot of disharmony and, you know, it's nothing, it doesn't seem to be working too well. But realize that actually it's better to be slightly more in harmony and kind because it leads your own easement in life. You have a bit more peace, you can practice yourself at ease because you're not so adding the fuel into the fire. If nobody ever tells you, like, work on it, and you just be angry person the rest of your life, well, does it, does it lead you anywhere? We need to be, you know, slightly idealistic. We need to put the bar higher than just here. Then you just argue and then, you know, tell, tell the priest and they will, you know, forgive you. No, you have to work with the partner. But yeah, yeah, loved ones create, create a lot of problems. Yeah. I can, I, everybody seems to be agreeing with that. That seems right. Okay. Harmony is idealistic, but arguing doesn't seem to be right. Hmm. Yeah. It comes from impermanence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, there's no, like I said, I mean, again, it's idealistic, but there's nothing real there. There's nothing, you know, your perceptions are. Uh, they are impermanent. Yep, okay. Oh, thank you, Ajahn. Um, one question that I had was, um, it seems to me that there's these two ideas of um, kindness and appreciation for our loved ones um, and attachment to them. Yeah. And um, it, it is said that um, we should be kind to them and appreciate them while we have them because... Mm -hmm. We will lose them one day. Yeah, and we need to be mindful of that and and contemplate that. But I find for myself that when contemplating that, um, it causes me to uh, become more attached uh, along the lines of I'll lose them one day. Mm -hmm. Or I need to see my parents. Oh, there's, there's like there's, a, the fear of losing. Yes. Sort yeah. of so I'll, if I'm going to lose them one day, then um, I should see them every day. Uh, kind of thing, make make the most yeah. of it. And that creates, uh, for me, uh, its own attachment. Um, can you give me any advice on, on that? Yeah, sure. The the fear of losing a, that, uh, that it can come up then, but then, you know, like, look, you're not permanent either. I mean, how, how do you know that you're not going to go before them? They, um, they, you, if you never really looked at it, if you just have that fear and never looked at the fear and um, you don't, you see the suffering arising. This is really, again, the first sutta, your loved ones are cause of suffering. 
And that's, that's part of the suffering. It is because we fear we're going to lose them. And so you see that that is, the, again, the teachings are applicable, that, that this is not an idealistic way of looking at it. It's causing you suffering, and that is the reality. The reality is that the attachment comes with the somebody we care. And the lo fear of losing them or losing them, it's all suffering. So you, you start... Mm, I don't. I can I don't know what else to do. Say that except that you you need to contemplate it. You need to look at it. You need when you're meditating. If you see it arising, and you accept it, it it's come to me again. And there's no way of intellectually stopping the care for the someone's we we lived for a long time. We cared, or they cared about us. There's no intellectual way of stopping it. But you sort of have to learn to accept that feeling that when it comes up, I can see it. And sometimes it could be gone for a long time and it just comes from the bushes. That sadness. Of course, we understand that it, everybody will die, but you will also die. And everything is constantly, Chinda was just saying, there's constantly, um, everything is unreliable. There's nothing in... In this universe, anywhere we see where you can just latch on, I hold on to this one and it won't change. Everything will change. But realize that your parents are the same like you are. They is, they're just made out of things. They're made out of... They, the mind is not permanently fixed either. So you are just looking at ideals of your parents. They are just their perceptions are the same like your perceptions. Your their bodies are made out of different things. Their will, they are the volition. They they are made out of. Their, it's conditioned. Human beings are just conditioned beings. They just there is something there, but ultimately, if you look at it, it's constantly changing. There's nothing permanent there. So you start seeing with the right wisdom. It's causes and conditions. One thing causes that to happen, and then that appears at this moment. But there's no, ultimately, there's no being there. So we start losing the attachment by, with right wisdom. But you know, look, this is another topic, and it could go on for a moment and on. But slowly, slowly, we will lessen that grip towards them and the sadness. So this is a path of happiness, actually. We talk about a lot of suffering. Your, your, your loved ones are cause of suffering, right? But this is a path of happiness because we lessen that attachment. We lessen that grief slowly, slowly, once we start seeing with the right wisdom. And then it's, it's easier, and then the suffering is less, and that's a source of happiness. Okay, I think we're getting close to the lunchtime, but is there anything shortly online I should answer? Uh, I have another question. Um, I think our pet fish is dying as we speak. Uh, question, how do I prepare and help my kids go through this time of possible death of our fish? <gasps> um, again, pets are source of suffering. Um, I guess, I don't know, with the children, I guess you you have to be honest, like, okay, pet faces, fishes are impermanent, and I'm sure um, they live a happy life now, we take care of them now, but yeah, we all must slowly, slowly perish, so I think it's good to talk to the children about it, and um, I, I'm really lucky with my, like, my my mom, we really have a good relationship about talking about death and all that. So it's it's good instead of hiding death. I know I know in some cultures you never really want to talk about death, but it's it's good to bring it up, talk about it, and becomes the no, it becomes like a normal thing. If you just hide it, and then death it seems to be hidden in in our society a lot of times. Me, I'm lucky. I'm a monk. I see a dead people here and there. Most of you never get to see dead people these days. I, I get to see them more often. So um, it becomes more normal. Uh, but it, it's good to talk about these things and good to contemplate this death. If we never think about it, well, it it becomes a non-issue. It becomes something we need to hide. We need to, don't need to hide about 
suffering and death and impermanence of life. Okay, let's go and have lunch. Sada, sada, so get. We have a late discussion today. I'm sorry I forgot to mention that earlier. It's at 12 o'clock after lunch. Please join us upstairs in the library at 12 o'clock. I see, and it'll be led by uh, Dr. Jai and supported by uh, Satish. All right. Thank you. Anyone is welcome. Please feel free to come up. Thank you. <laughs>